Hello, everybody. I'm here at the uh, San Francisco Botanical Gardens. Family of ravens here. Looks like some young ones. They're uh, they're practicing their pleading behavior. You can tell they're young in various ways. Uh, one of the ways you can tell is that they're too big, right? Young ravens go through a phase where they're kind of uh, awkward. Huh? And the one down there, the largest one, the largest looking one, is all fluffed out. <clears throat> I'm both a little excited and a little bit nervous today because I've got some very interesting things to share with you. Um, it's also a, a little bit strange to be back inside the botanical gardens, which is the living place I am most mm, intimate with around here. Um, the botanical gardens here are world gardens. Um, we have, because we have a peculiar kind of climate, many plants will grow here that ordinarily would not thrive um, in, in other kinds of climates. And so the gardens are broken down <laughs> or organized. It's interesting that organized and broken down, <laughs> these are synonymous. Uh, they're broken down um, into specific uh, countries. So the garden is a bit like a like a microcosm of the world, and that's both beautiful and unfortunate because. It's beautiful in that people who visit here have a chance to see plants from all over the world. It's unfortunate for a wide variety of reasons, including the fact that humans organize everything. Oh, this is an interesting, crazy wood pile. That is pretty new. Lots of things have changed in the garden since I was last here. Although I was last here um, covertly. <laughs> uh, and I'm going to select a path through the gardens based primarily on avoiding other humans so that I won't have to keep putting my mask on and off or my, my um, handkerchief actually. Having to put one's mask on and off is much more dangerous in some ways than, uh, than not having a mask or just having it on all the time. Of course we wear masks to protect others primarily. This is the crucial point grievously overlooked by many opinionated people who think we shouldn't have to wear masks. Um, they'll claim, the masks don't protect you. Yes, they're not for protecting me, they're for protecting others. In case this isn't clear. Um, some people are bold enough to claim that uh, there isn't even a virus. It's a complex claim. Is there a flower there? Does it slightly resemble the pictures we've seen, the representations of the coronavirus? <laughs> Whether or not there's a flower there is totally up to you, right? You can determine what to call that or not, but it seems pretty clear to me, and I'm quite skeptical in my own way, that there is a very dangerous viral contagion circulating among the humans. 
at the moment. Its origins are not clear. They have not been proven. No one has proven that the virus comes from bats. No one has proven that the virus doesn't come from a laboratory. Um, what we have on that front are mostly opinions. And I've seen research that supports the fact that the virus probably was not assembled by humans piece by piece. That's almost certainly not what happened with the novel coronavirus, which is the virus I'm talking about. Um, however, uh, there is research that supports the perspective that the virus's peculiar affinity for human ACE2 is very unlikely to have become as sophisticated as it is via a single leap of mutation. And that could mean all kinds of things. Um, one of the things it might mean is that other, this has not been really explored in research. This is a perspective from someone who works in biomedicine myself, um, is that the virus circulated among humans before the, the primary outbreak and mutated over time to enhance its affinity for human ACE2. That's conceivable. Um, uh, another possibility is that the virus was produced purposefully um, in a gain of function research, uh, which we are aware the Wuhan lab is involved in. This looks like to me a pipevine swallowtail caterpillar that may be preparing. I don't know if I, I can't see what the camera captures when I turn it. I'm gonna try this again. So I think this is a pipevine swallowtail caterpillar that may be preparing to create a chrysalis. And this right here, this little tiny black thing that's the skin of a caterpillar that previously did that. We are in the flower moon, the latter part, latter half of the flower moon of the uh, of the the Blackfoot phenological moon cycles. This is a chrysalis. This is an evacuated chrysalis right here of, let's see if I can make sure I capture this. There we go. That's an evacuated chrysalis of a pipe vine swallowtail. And on this side here, you may be able to see the little strands that connect it to the, to the stone. There's a, there are two connecting points, one at the bottom, which is kind of gluey and one at the top, which is more of a strand. It's like a little loop. Uh, oh, there's juice inside it. Wow. It must have opened very recently. The strands at the top are incredibly strong. Hmm. I wonder why there's so much juice. It looks like blood. But um, there is no creature in there. There's no creature in there. 
But the chrysalis is empty. I did not harm the creature. Though I wanted to uh, take the chrysalis off the stone. I wanted to see how strongly it was attached. And I was very surprised. The strength required to remove the abandoned chrysalis was significant much greater than I had imagined. I don't see any... Um, that one caterpillar that I showed you is the only one uh, I see. I'm not seeing any caterpillars on the pipe vine itself. Um, oh wait, here's one. So here's a pipe vine swallowtail caterpillar. Um, it's eating a piece of pipe vine. It's a pipe vine swallowtail caterpillar. And this uh, this place here is seeded with these um, by a young man who works at the uh, Academy of Sciences. This is a chrysalis that a butterfly... So, um, had a little interruption there, and I'm not sure if I got to show. Uh, here's another pipe vine, a swallowtail caterpillar, eating a leaf of pipe vine. And I'm still very surprised by the amount of liquid that was left in the clearly abandoned chrysalis here, All right? And how strong the little strands that attach the chrysalis to the stone that it emerged from are. I have one of these at home that somebody um, detached some time ago and I took it home and attached it in a way that should allow the butterfly to emerge if it wasn't killed by being detached. Perhaps soon I will find out. Um, you'll notice where I, later you will notice where I connected these two videos because uh, my iPhone became full. Here are a few more instances of the, the pipevine caterpillars. I saw an extremely tiny one, and at the moment, they're very kind of silky. They're kind of silky smooth. There's an astonishing number of them here today, and it's interesting that at the same time, obviously the chrysalis was just vacated because it contained... First of all, I could see that something had emerged from it. The chrysalis had broken open. And I could uh, determine that the creature inside had vacated the chrysalis. So it, it, it became a butterfly. But in the bottom of the chrysalis was a reservoir of blood-like substance, which I'm certainly not afraid of. Oh, I just scared a butterfly away that we could have took a look at. But it wasn't a pipe vine swallowtail. Um, it was sunning itself. So, this little location in the gardens um, is seeded with pipe vines by a young man who works at the Academy of Sciences here. And he's a fascinating fellow who uh, who cultivates pipe vine swallowtails. This is one of my favorite plants. It's referred to as hummingbird sage. It's very sticky. You can see how things stick to it. I'm just so excited to be back in the gardens that I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm more closely attending the living things than my agenda because the living things are certainly profound enough to preempt my agenda.
and the living beings here, they are astonishing. Pretty sure there's a hawk up in this tree because the some of the smaller birds are responding as if there's a nearby hawk. All right. So I'm, I have a couple of topics in mind today and they relate to the recent situation with what I'm going to generally refer to as catastrophic cultural dissonance. Um, not that our culture is regularly harmonious, that is, itself is an illusion produced by layers and layers of regulating fiction and narrative that we lay on top of what's actually going on, mostly to hide things like omnicide, atrocity, cruelty, rape, violence, hatred, ignorance. Um, there's a human monkey in here, apparently. So yeah, there's, there's all these layers of fiction, right? And media, a number of human monkeys. The media makes money by um, crafting and reinforcing narrative fictions. Humans use narratives to structure identity, role, relationship, value, memory, and that last one is really the crucial one, even though it's perhaps the most nuanced and subtle. We employ narratives as a kind of shorthand that keep us from needing to do very difficult work disambiguating situations, phenomenon, that we encounter or participate in. Oh, the scent of this Brugamensia is just overwhelming, overwhelming today. Devil's trumpet, angel's trumpet, you get to pick. Oh my God, <laughs> beautiful. One of the things I was gonna say earlier is that the garden's kind of tragic because there are so many exotic species here that they're, uh, It's all good. That their natural relational symbionts are missing. So the insects and birds and microbes and other plants that would naturally symbiose with the plants from all around the world are not here. And that means that many of the organisms that live here live without the possibility of, of, of much like we do, right? We, we, we live in an abstracted, regularized, box-like context of structured fictions instead of living with each other in nature. And it's bizarre to say that we aren't living with nature is like saying that my fingers aren't living with my hand. It's that, that's how intimate the actual relationship between our people and nature is. So when Structured fictions and behaviors and roles and corporations and governments and religions and um, political factions, ideological factions, when these intrude into our lives so severely that we primarily become their exponents, right? We just become expressions of them. We lose our humanity. Our intelligence plummets to something barely recognizable as intelligence. And the fact that we're capable of, of using language to describe or explain or model or simulate things actually becomes a deficit rather than an asset. <clears throat> and this is the condition that all of us find ourselves in to some degree. For some of us, this degree is unimaginably severe. For others, it is relative to those people more, you know, more modest. But we, our, our, our supercultures aren't us. I wanna be really clear about this. 
They're more like an emergent phenomenon of our behavior. In fact, the idea of culture there really isn't any such thing as culture in the same way there's no such thing as Buddhism, right? Buddhism is a word that refers to a variety of practices and, and behaviors and exponents of a ideological or practical tradition, right? But you can't find Buddhism, right? What you can find are writings that could be classified as the, pro the product of Buddhists. Um, you can find people meditating in a fashion that would be understood as Buddhist, but you can't find Buddhism. And in the same way, there really isn't anything like culture. Culture is a shorthand word we use to encompass a vastly sophisticated, multi-layered, multi-dimensional, constellated array or matrix of phenomenon, behaviors, identifications, so on and so forth. So our culture doesn't really exist, and this is part of the problem we think it does, right? And we believe that the multi-layered tower of mostly lethal, meaning causing you to forget and also toxically deadly, fictions that we um, are referring to when we use this word culture, these are largely invisible to us unless something causes them to jump out at us, right? Unless there's some relatively significant uh, event, right, that produces a highly visible and sometimes shocking disruption, then, and only then, do the majority of people, and the majority of people is also a weird construct, then and only then do vastly larger numbers of people begin to pay attention. And when this disruption happens, they all try to form bizarre explanations as to why it occurred and justifications for it or to vilify it or so on and so forth. All of that's entirely natural except that it isn't doing what it pretends to do, right? Primarily what is getting done is that those multiple layers of narrative fictions and descriptive fictions are just sort of having a little earthquake. They're just reorganizing tiny little pieces of their structure in a way that largely sustains the overarching narratives, right? And slightly modulates some of the little sub-narratives. In case it isn't obvious, our species has reached the point where that kind of behavior will no longer suffice. And what's going to happen, well, no one can say exactly what's going to happen, but in my perspective what's most likely to happen, is that our willingness to believe and enact these fictions has set up a cascade of catastrophes that are beginning now for the first time to emerge into more or less common consciousness. We've been aware of these things for 50 years. I've been aware of them since I was a child, since I was five or six. Um, people like Rachel Carson, who wrote Silent Spring, about the devastating impact of DDT on the ecologies in maybe the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, people like Alvin Toffler, who wrote Future Shock, uh, one of the most brilliant and prophetic books I ever read <laughs> as, a, as a young child. I think I read that when I was nine. Um, these people announced what was coming in very clear ways that were unambiguous, um, profound, demonstrable, shocking, provocative, and absolutely worthy of our attention. There wasn't a we to ignore them. There wasn't really any kind of structured we. The, the we, quote unquote, that, that we have is, is another fiction. It's a fiction of largely victim-like membership in supercultures. And those supercultures are themselves vast, um, Leviathan-like 
monolithic uh, fictions, much like the idea that we might have of, of Babylon or some of the images I've seen, drawings, old drawings, of artists' interpretations of the Tower of Babylon. I'm at the little uh, pond where I sometimes practice frog sneaking, and there were some frogs here the last time I was here, but I did not hear any today. So, the problem is that our supercultures and corporations and nations and military industrial complexes and prison industrial complexes, which actually schools, what we call schools are little sort of mini prisons, even though we pretend otherwise. I saw a picture on Facebook yesterday from schools in uh, Nigeria where Young men were lined up 30, 40 at a time, lying on their stomachs, waiting to be flogged by their agriculture teacher or their, um, <laughs> their uh, geography teacher. And so a man was, was standing over them with a giant like bat-like stick, and he was just going to beat these people, these poor young men. <laughs> and, and that helped me remember that what we call schools are, are largely preparation for a prison-like um, experience of life beyond them. And although it, it isn't obvious, one way to understand the weird diseases that we live in and call our culture is as seed beds for prisons. They're meant to produce prisoners. And this is why you know, we have the nine to five. This is why we have police and the military fighting wars that are largely invented. This is why our, the budget, the combined budgets for our prison systems and our military so grossly outweigh any other investment as to render those other investments nearly meaningless in comparison. Um, dollar for dollar. So, I want to talk about two, I've got kind of two topics in mind and I'm beginning to introduce them with, by, by discussing this layered fiction situation that we're in and how some of those fictions are beginning to be penetrated. And it's because we've been able, the reason that we've been able to sustain these fictions is that nature and the poor have been absorbing the damage caused by enforcing them for a good, you know, for many hundreds of years. It's always been this way in, in colonial society, right? We offload the damage that we'd otherwise be blatantly aware of. On to, we hide it in nature and we hide it in classes that lie below the most privileged. We hide it in the poor. They're the ones who take the damage. They're the ones who get poisoned. They're the ones whose lands are stolen. If they don't have wealth and weapons, we wipe them out. And we also, I think our, our culture, our American culture, is fundamentally founded on piracy, right? So what that means is that the big pirates eat up the small pirates and the small pirates feed on whatever resources they can get until they build up enough value or wealth that it attracts the big pirates and then the big pirates come in and steal all that and wipe out the small pirates and absorb them. And in case you think this is unlikely, just watch Facebook absorbing things like Instagram, you know, uh, Snapchat, TikTok, whatever. You can see this process at work. And we used to have um, laws I can't recall the specific. Uh, <laughs> I can't recall the specific aspect of law, but we had like anti-monopoly laws, and we still have them. They're just not really enacted with the same, with sufficient ferocity to make them useful. Uh, so that one man owns most of the newspapers in the United States. That guy's Rupert Murdoch. Um, And essentially, 
in an array of situations that resemble something like the factions of Star Wars, except that the rebels mostly just get slaughtered and the Empire obliterates not just not just the common people, but the history and future of life on Earth successfully all day long, every day, and nearly nothing else ever happens. And when it does, it's on a scale so modest that the Empire can just brush it off and go on with business as usual. And that's what's been going on for a long time in every domain we can think of. Um, healthcare, politics, education, environmentalism, um, the formation of the of the possibility of building intelligent societies. These things have just been getting ripped apart from underneath them and replaced with little structured fictions that manage to keep the common people satisfied enough not to do anything too, too violent or radical or intelligent, not to, not to foment something that could overthrow them. And that's what we're going to have to do. It doesn't have to be violent, by the way. It doesn't even have to be revolutionary. We just need to invent together societies intelligent enough, humane enough, nobly impurposed enough that they outcompete the hot garbage, to use a friend of mine's phrase, that currently dominates the void in the between of us where we have failed to do that together with and for each other and the history of life on Earth. Now, the two topics I want to address today, uh, to get to one of them, and I'll probably fumble it a little bit, and I don't feel entitled to share the story that illustrated that my dear friend Ryan Firstdiver, please follow him on YouTube and Facebook. His YouTube videos are incredibly profound, particularly um, his videos about the living places and the living animals and his phenological engagement videos. Um, but Ryan is a Blackfoot beaver man. He's one of the last remaining beaver men of the Blackfoot people who lives in Alberta. And I encourage you to follow him. He's one of my dearest friends and I am privileged to be able to know him not only as a friend, but as a teacher. And of course, he and I learn together and we make a pretty good pair. We switch back and forth between uh, Sherlock Holmes and Watson all the time. And that's a joyful and amazing privilege. When we were speaking the other day, he told me the Blackfoot phrases um, that came from a story that one of his teachers, uh, one of his most revered teachers, whose last name I do not know, but I will um, withhold his name for now. This man is not a man to repeat things lightly, and he apparently repeated this to Ryan on a number of occasions. Thankfully, I think I was able to understand the gist of it the first time Ryan explained it to me the other day and the story that he shared along with it was profoundly illustrative of this idea but essentially the Blackfoot people have a word for suppose you are out on the plains and maybe you have a horse or maybe not but in the distance yeah in the far distance you see someone and so you think, oh, there is a, there is a f being. And probably you can tell, most likely, if it's far away, you might be able to tell, it is a human being. Right? So there is a word for, oh, off in the distance there is a being. And maybe a human being. 
And then when it comes closer, you might be able to make out certain features. These could be colors or symbols. These are things that resemble flags or badges or emblems in our colonial society. And you might get the sense of, hmm, that might be a man from this particular tribe, from some particular tribe, uh, because you recognize sort of the, the general um, implications of what you can see in the middle distance between very far away and right up close. And if you get right up close, then you might see, you'll know who this person is. Maybe you will know, oh, there is, it's Darren. Oh, that's great, it's Darren. Or, you know, it is in fact a man from, from my tribe or a neighboring tribe or a tribe with which our tribe is in competition or and perhaps, I wonder if they actually have the word enemy because their language tends to be so astonishingly intelligent <laughs> that they, they avoid, they, they naturally avoid collapsing identity into explicit derivatives. Think about that for a minute, my friends. Mmm, California sagebrush. One of my ally plants that I love. About to flower. Just about to flower. They resist collapsing things into explicit derivatives. And in fact, I think this is very important. Uh, when Ryan and I were having this discussion, he explained to me, I, I, I was speaking to him about disambiguation and how in our culture it's uh, traditional, if not expected, to completely disambiguate things, right? To disambiguate them all the way down to, you know, their Latinate <laughs> biological names or, you know, that is a red-tailed hawk, that is, you know, my friend Joe, that is my enemy Charlie, whatever, right? We disambiguate all the way down, yeah? And their language naturally preserves a degree of ambigu ambiguity and openness that we could learn a lot from. Um, but one of the things Ryan said, and I'm gonna get back to why I mentioned those three uh, layers of distance in a moment, is that uh, in Blackfoot, it's very frowned upon. It's essentially taboo to say that I know something. You can say he knows, she knows, or they know. You can get away with that. But if someone says like, do you know the story? You say, no, I don't, I don't know the story. Even if you know the story. Can you see how intelligent this is? It is in a way saying, I lay no claim to knowledge as an individual. Knowledge is perhaps something we have together, but it is inappropriate. <laughs> and possibly it's inappropriate because it's lethally dangerous to communal relations to say that I know what this is or that is, or this isn't or that isn't. Yeah? You see how different this is from our culture and how important this one little feature might be? This is why People ask me like, why are you so fascinated with language? This is why I'm so fascinated with language. Because the language that we use and the way that we use it inclines us to forms of thought and behavior and roles that we won't survive. It's not that they're, it's not that they're not good. They make cancer look like something you wanna get. Uh, they're terrible, they're just, it's unimaginable, and I've had a glimpse beyond this, thank goodness, thank, <laughs> thank my lucky stars, I was afforded a glimpse from beyond the scope of language. And so I very much, I, I'm highly motivated to share that with my fellow English speakers, because if we are not trained to understand 
the deadly common functions and features of the ways that we are trained and rewarded for using language, our minds collapse into shells. And we might think, you know, I'm smart or I'm this or I'm that. It won't help you to be smart. You'll still be trapped in a cage you can't see because it's the cage you use to see with. And that's one of the deadliest kinds of traps one can be in, right? When, when the things that you use to see with are themselves <laughs> so poorly yet subtly structured that they comprise a trap you can never detect. And language is one of these traps and our cultures reinforce and reward it. So in my conversation with Ryan the other day, for which I'm so grateful, um, and for which I feel so lucky to have, um, oh yeah, here's some uh, serious owl pellets. They're old. Um, oh, there's a pretty new one, kind of small. Uh, but yeah, there's, a, there's a, I know, <laughs> I, I was already, I knew what to look for because you see this scat here, these little traces of, of white on the ground, right? That's raptor scat. And where you find a lot of raptor scat like this, you're gonna find owl pellets. Now they might not be from owls. And um, these pellets are a digestive behavior of raptors. Uh, where they don't, see they can't, they can't digest everything, right? You can see some little bones in there and what looks like a claw or a tooth. Oh my, this place is just littered with pellets. My goodness. There's a skull. It's actually a skull in there. See that? That's the skull of another bird. No, wait. What is that? I don't know. I don't know what that skull is. That's a really peculiar pellet. I can see the fangs. I can see teeth. It might be the, I don't know, it's so long, it's elongated. Hmm. But I, I was aware, whoops, that um, this area, owl's nest here, yeah, I was aware of this. And so what has happened is that the tall grasses have all dried out, yeah? And since they've all dried out, the pellets that were previously hidden by the grasses have emerged. And this process resembles the way that these layered fictions I was talking about earlier, when the season comes for them to die off, right? When the layered fictions die off, then underneath them, we find dead bodies. We find the dead bodies of nature, of our fellow human beings. Um, sorry, I got, I got myself into a little trouble there for a moment, accidentally. Holy shit. Uh, that was a lot more than a little trouble. I need to leave the area. Um, <laughs> boy, that could have turned bad fast. Wow. So what happened? Um, geez. It, it seems so uh, metaphoric. 
And I'm really, really lucky right now. I'm really, really lucky. I made a terrible mistake. Um, holy crap. <laughs> it's, so, it's so bizarre what I was talking about. So when the overgrowth of fictions dies down, then we find dead bodies. And what had happened was I left the path in an attempt to bag that, um, that pellet with the skull in it for further examination. Unbeknownst to me, I stepped right on a yellow jacket nest. For me to have not been badly stung right now is a miracle I do not understand. Uh, as I was, I was so focused on the camera and on you know, what I was doing that I was not paying attention to where I was stepping. Welcome to being human. Mmm. Salvia nectar. And then I saw the telltale movements of the flight patterns of wasps. And then I saw incoming wasps. And then suddenly I realized, oh my goodness, I'm literally standing not exactly on the opening of the nest, but within inches of it. And wow, am I lucky. Um, because trust me when I tell you, you do not want to anger a nest of yellow jackets by standing on them. And anybody ignorant enough, hi there, uh, to pull a stunt like that, wow. I mean, I just got, I can't imagine how lucky I just got. I just don't even understand it. I feel like maybe because I'm talking about nature and our relationship with it, uh, the spirit of my, of the way that I'm in the world right now helped me to be less visible to the yellow jackets. Yeah? So did not interpret me as an enemy even though and see, this is the thing. There aren't really exactly... The idea of an enemy, it's not, the, it's not right. Um, it's too disambiguated, right? And this is part of the problem that we're having in our modern cultures. We're using extreme disambiguations in situations that require ambiguity to be preserved. And it's very important that we learn about this together. And this is part of why this topic has been common in my videos lately. Now, to get back to the three distances, right? We're pretty good at understanding, you know, unless we're on a battlefield, in which case things change. And it's important to notice that and to, to acknowledge that. We're pretty good at telling, uh, understanding, oh, it's a human being. And at a distance, you know, we're probably not inclined to fear them. Hopefully, right? Again, depending on the context. At, so at a distance, yeah, it's pretty much okay. In the middle ground, where the symbols and representations give us clues, that's where the trouble is. That's where we're doing disambiguation based on structured fictions of identity. And that's where the problem in our culture is. That's what racism is. That's what genderism is. That's what classism is, right? We're, we're using the representational shorthand to determine how we should relate with another human being. And we're not up close, we're not intimate with them. And once we've decided how to relate with them by some, you know, ridiculous representational shorthand like their race or their gender, and of course, we, by we, here I'm referring to something like uh, the police, yeah, or hate groups, right, um, or groups that are inclined to be um, extremely prejudiced and celebrate prejudice, yeah, and there are many such groups. And some of them are very casual, right, some of them aren't, you know, badge wearing. But notice that the people who do wear badges and emblems, they're not relating with a human being 
when they're suffocating them or beating them or telling them they're going to take them out into a field and make them disappear and, you know, killing their family or killing their children or killing their animals. They're not relating with them as human beings. They're relating with them in that middle ground, in that representational ground, where it's not really a person, it's an object. And it's a bad object. So we should destroy it. It'd be better if it was just destroyed. Yeah. I'm going to get to... I have another take on this. I'm actually going to be brave enough to walk past this yellow jacket nest again, hoping that they didn't mark me with pheromones the first time. But because I didn't get stung to shit... <laughs> The first time, I'm pretty sure they didn't mark me. Because if they'd have marked me, they'd have followed me. And I would not have been able to escape. <laughs> now see, the problem is I kind of want to retrieve the owl pellet. The question is, am I brave enough to attempt it? But keep my topic in mind while I have this adventure here. Um, and hopefully don't make a really stupid mistake. Let's prep a little bit here. Yeah, jeez. Oh my god. I was standing right on their nest. Oh my god. How did I not get stung? Huh. How did I not get stung? Wow. That is incredible. I think I'm going to leave that owl pellet alone. <laughs> oh my god! I was standing right on a yellow jacket nest. Like, if you knew my history, and some of my viewers do, you'd know, like, uh, uh, I can't believe that I stood on a yellow jacket nest. Uh, all right. Something is protecting me today because literally I was standing right on top of it. Um, and generally, once they mark you, you're out of luck. <laughs> you're just, like, they can follow you for, you know, half a mile or a mile or maybe longer. Um, and they didn't sting me even once. Wow. And I, like, they didn't, they obviously didn't mark me or they'd be chasing me, right? And on moss. Whew. Boy, I dodged a bullet that time. I'm going to leave that owl pellet alone. I could come back for it at night if I wanted to. Presuming I was in here once the nest um, becomes inactive, I could go back for that pellet, but nope. I'm leaving that thing where it is. I'm not going near that thing. I can't believe I was, I was literally standing right on top of a yellow jacket nest. Huh. You know, I think that's, that's metaphoric, right? Because what I was talking about when I was doing that is exactly the problem. Um, humans think nature is dangerous or blah, blah, No, it's humans that are dangerous to nature. And when we ignore, you know, and we're not paying attention and we're just sort of pursuing our own little <laughs> fictions and desires, then we step right on things that we should be paying attention to. Hmm. This is a time when uh, many queen bumblebees die. I've helped a few of them lately. Sometimes they can't be saved. Uh, now, of course, if the people in the park noticed that nest, they try to eradicate it, which is wrong. Um, putting up a sign to alert people is okay. Eradicating it, that's dumb. That's just wrong. It's like cutting off one of your own fingers because you scratched yourself with it, right? Uh, the creatures in the, the living beings in the world, we are extensions of them. We cannot harm them without harming ourselves. And when we dump harm wholesale into the oceans and the forests, the waves of repercussion that will come back to haunt us for generations, you don't even want to understand what's hiding behind the layered fictions we protect our minds and hearts with. And those fictions have worn thin because we've been hiding damage in the ecologies and the poor and the defenseless for so damn long with such incredible hubris, such unjustifiable hubris, um, 
arrogance that there's no chance we're going to escape the repercussions. No chance. This is a feather of one of the owls that quite possibly produced those pellets. And what I was going to say earlier is that there's a, um, there's a pair of nesting owls over there, and I've known that for a long time. But to only today is the first time when the grasses have been dry enough that I can see all the pellets. I knew they were there, but I couldn't find them. And this is the same season when the yellow jackets and the paper wasps and other similar organisms are very busy. Yeah. Oh, here's a, here's a Cooper's hawk. I don't know if you'll be able to see it. That could be, it could be a red tail. It saw me. It saw my camera too, for sure. It was so well camouflaged, I was lucky to notice it. By the way, we use fictions to camouflage atrocity. That's why we have newspapers and Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and all this stuff. That stuff's just mostly ca camouflage for atrocity. Um, this, pretty sure, this is quinoa. Yeah. <laughs> so, our people have a real serious problem with that middle distance. And this is what Ryan was trying to illustrate to me in our conversation. Uh, the day before yesterday, I think now? Yeah. Friday, I think? And he told me a complex story, um, one that I've heard before. Just a second. But I'm... I'm attentive enough to understand that when I have the honor to hear a story, what the, what the Blackfoot people call stories, they're not merely stories. To even hear one, something is exchanged, something comes into you. They are not magical spells, though they bear some resemblance. So that when you hear this story, you are receiving an incredible, non-ordinary asset. And to receive that asset with respect and attention, this grants benefits. This uh, This endows one with nourishing awareness. Not all of it, most of it not intellectual. A whole, it carry, the story carries a payload of non-ordinary awareness, understanding, relationships, connections. And so unlike a regular story that I might hear in English, um, when I, when I, I'm so lucky as to hear a Blackfoot story or the story from a story from another indigenous person or culture like the Navajo Beauty Way stories. I pay very close attention because I learned a long time ago. <laughs> and I'm still quite stupid. I'm not I'm not saying I know. <laughs> Believe me, I don't know. <laughs> I'm an unknownist. Yet I have noticed, or I can say I have noticed <laughs> that there that these stories they carry a payload and if properly received the payload gives you seeds, and the seeds grow in you over time, and they grow in your dreaming, yeah? Not just in your waking life. And it's very important that we understand the nature of stories like this and the power that they carry, because the stories we have are missing the payload. Lots of them. Um, there's all kinds of complex reasons for that. I'm not here to, to explain that. I just want to say that 
the fact that I had heard this story before, not only did it not affect, not only did the fact that I heard the story before not reduce my enthusiasm, it had the opposite effect, it increased it. Now imagine if we had experiences like that commonly, where, you know, our relationships with beings and places that were familiar became more enriching each time we encountered them. When our relationships with language and knowledge, awareness, understanding, and perspective became more enriching each time we encountered them. So that we would not become bored by the fact that we're no longer receiving the, the invisible payload that should be carried by communication and storying whose purposes are true in the sense of being true to the origins and history and future of life on earth and humanity and our hearts, our spirits, uh, the anciently evolved relationships with nature that have been so recently and devastatingly discarded. So it's this middle ground where the humans have the problem, right? Far away, a human being, that's, that's okay, we see a human being, we know they are human already, right? Up close, it's Darren, we're pretty good at that, right? I know whether Joe's okay or not. But in the middle ground, where I don't see a human being, I see a representation. Oh, that's a man of X race, or that's a person of X gender, yeah? In that place, there's trouble. And there's particularly trouble with the organs of enforcement, and this is my second, second part of my topic today, that our supercultures have invented as expressions of their character and purpose. We need to understand that. For a long time, I've said the prisons are an abomination we cannot afford. They have to be eradicated entirely. And people will say, well, what do you expect us to do instead? And what those people don't realize is that to answer that question, we would first have to establish societies intelligent enough that prisons weren't their natural result. You see? And unfortunately, we haven't done that. The reason that we have... Uh, <laughs> a burgeoning, explosively unjustified military spending, prison spending, um, uh, a system of wealth caching that is the, it's trickle up, except a lot of the time it's gush up, right? So if you can wipe out a whole living place, um, abstract value will gush toward the investors who paid the relatively minimal prices to have that done. And since those investors cannot be targeted, they cannot be indicted, though corporations can, the only thing that happens to corporations is they pay fines. So all they have to do is make more, funny, more money than the, that's funny that I said that, make more money than the fines they have to pay, and they're making a profit. You can't be in prison, a corporation, it can't be punished in the way a human can. And this is part of why we call things like limited liability, right? Because their liability is limited. <laughs> um, so, The humans have been playing a game of fictions, and the pirates in the culture, who are mostly, you know, the, the wealthy and the entitled. Um, and by the way, entitled, it goes back to, like, having land in colonial, like, England or something, right? People who had titles um, usually were granted land so they could own the living world, parts of the living world, in perpetuity pretty astonishing idea. Absolutely insane. In any case, um, since our prison, <laughs> since our prison-like cultures um, produce the necessity of prisons, to, if, when people ask me, like, what should we do instead, I, I have to begin by suggesting that we establish something that doesn't resemble and produce prisons as a natural result of its structured fictions. Right? 
so that we, we would produce, and by the way, as I've said many times before, this can be done on a very small scale. It happens all the time between two or three or five people. We establish an amazingly playful, um, mutually supportive unity, we have an adventure, and then we go back to prison in the nine to five, right? And people can't wait to do this. They're dying to do this. If you just gave them a way to have meaningful roles and uh, still, while having meaningful roles, um, supply the necessities of their lives, like shelter and food and clothing and healthcare and stuff like this, they wouldn't do anything else. <laughs> and the systems that we serve today are so vicious, so malignant, that it really shouldn't be hard to outcompete them with another contender. The problem is they have vast momentum, so nobody has come up with a contender. We've been too busy building corporations and startups and technology. We have not engineered, we haven't looked, not only have we not engineered intelligent culture, we've done the opposite. Our culture has been like nose diving down, you know, toward uh, the most crude of possible derivatives while, you know, technologies and startups and corporations and such are being rapidly, ever more rapidly developed and deployed. In case it's not blatantly obvious, that's a recipe for absolute disaster. And the longer we ignore it, the more severe and diverse the cascade of disasters that will emerge from that is. And everybody's, you know, everybody knows like something's wrong. And because these people live in the layered array of media fictions, they're busily exchanging little media objects, pretending that they know what's wrong. Um, <laughs> that's part of what's wrong. That doesn't help us. Right? Yelling at pirates doesn't affect them. In fact, the more you yell at pirates, the happier they get. And the reason they get happier is that when you yell at pirates, they profit. And the reason that they profit is you're yelling at them with the tools that they themselves own. So every time you use those tools, they make money and they acquire intelligence about you, your social connections, your psychographic data, who you are likely to like or not like, how they can um, enforce or reinforce factionating behavior in little subgroups of populations. Uh, and so the pirates just get happier the more you yell. I tried to communicate this to liberals and Democrats who were yelling at Trump before he was elected. And they didn't realize they were, practic they were helping to guarantee his election. But there were many features that resulted in that previously unimaginable tragedy. And one of them was just the fact that the Republicans practically obliterated the capacity for our schools to educate us in their assaults on public infrastructure throughout the 70s, 80s, particularly the 80s and 90s and early 2000s. Um, and I've gone on about this in many other videos, so I'll, I'll sidestep it here. But what I want to, to get at is that our police and our military, they, sir, they are the analogy, this is really important, I like biological analogies much more than mechanical ones. Most of the mechanical ones are false. They're two steps away from what we should be looking at, which is organism, nature. Uh, our military and our police represent the analogy of our immune systems. And I want to be really, I want to, I want to take some time to both ambiguize, ambiguate and disambiguate this term immune system. So people have said the gut was the second brain. My friend Kevin would say the immune system was the second brain, the gut was the third. I would say the gut was the first brain, the immune system was the second brain, and once you had those two you got to have brains. And why would my friend Kevin, who's a molecular biologist and a neuroscientist, why would he say the immune system is the second brain? Well, the immune system has a very specific array of 
behaviors. I don't want to call them jobs because they're not jobs. And I don't want to call them responsibilities because they're not responsibilities. What they are, are relational inclinations. That's a good, that's a good phrase. I trust that. Our immune systems, first of all, are so sophisticated that science will never catch up to them. In fact, I'm going to be so bold as to say that what we call science will never suffice to encompass a quarter of what our immune systems are and do. Okay, so here's a little grove of dawn redwoods. These amazing organisms are the ancient ancestors of redwood trees and they are deciduous. They lose their greenery in the winter. And this little grove was badly damaged by the fall of that tree. And I have not seen them in greenery till now. You can see this tree was badly injured and this little tree took the brunt of the damage, but yet it still got a little sprout there of living greenery. And I love these trees very much. Their name doesn't matter, but I love to say it. It's um, Metasequoia glyptostroboides. <laughs> it's just fun to say. It's also fun to just exercise my vocabulary, and I need to because I'm getting older. It needs exercise to survive. But I'm glad to see the little one has a tiny, a tiny spot of greenery, just one. And I love these trees. And all of these trees come from a single tree that I believe was discovered, if I remember correctly, in China in the late 1800s by a biologist who thought it was extinct. They found a single tree growing alongside a monastery. And all of the trees of this type in uh, Golden Gate Park and in the rest of the world come from that single mother tree. And there are at least 30 of them here. I, I occasionally discover new ones, as I did last week. Now, back to the topic at hand, the immune system. Our immune systems are so unimaginably sophisticated, science will never get, it'll never encompass a quarter of their sophistication. I, I'd be surprised if we get, even if you say like, well, give us a thousand years or 10,000 years, it won't matter because nature is, is evolving and developing. And those are two different things, by the way, involving. Evolving is not development necessarily. Nature is evolving and developing so astonishingly quickly compared to our capacity to represent it in models and theories and research that we'll never catch up. So we should respect that fact and realize it, right? That we're not going to catch up. Um, and we shouldn't take the knowledge that we have, however seemingly effective or utilitarian, to be anywhere near complete. We should take it to be incredibly partial if we're intelligent. And believe me that scientists are aware of this. If you ask them like, how much of the immune system have, do we know? Like, what do we know about, what's the percentage of knowledge that we have acquired compared to the complexity of the immune, the immune system? A good scientist, I'm guessing here, someone correct me if you think I'm wrong, they're gonna say something like 2%. They might even say less than 1%, right? So when you say something to a scientist like, um, strengthening the immune system. For most scientists, that phrase is nonsensical. For one thing, what do you mean? It doesn't, it's, it's a meaningless phrase. The thing is so diverse and, and complex and sophisticated, what would it mean to strengthen it? Not only that, um, the, the phrase your immune system refers to such a vast array, <laughs> such a diverse library of biological inclinations entities, uh, relationships and activities, that to put them all together into one thing is kind of confused to begin with. Yet we can do it, and we can even do it usefully. We can learn things. So the immune system is unimaginably sophisticated, very, very complex. And now I'm looking where I'm walking. <laughs> if I'm walking off a trail, I'm gonna be watching that from now on. No more stepping on yellow jacket nests for me. Um, So the reason my friend Kevin calls the immune system the second brain is one of its primary relational in inclinations is to determine the difference between what belongs 
on and in me and what is a potentially dangerous intruder. And it does this so intelligently that it doesn't just go around killing things or even imprisoning them, though but those, both of those metaphors are reasonable analogs of what the immune system can do. It also integrates, right? In fact, um, the animal cell is the likely result, as proven by Carl Sagan's brilliant wife, Lynn Margulis, <laughs> much to the chagrin of academia. Um, our animal cells are the likely result of mergers between kinds of cells that once, you know, mergers between cells that consumed other biological organisms and digested them. And some of the undigested organisms eventually became symbionts and complex animal cells were the result of that. Um, this is the symbiogenesis theory of animal cell development. Lynn Margulis was roundly criticized and ejected from academia for proposing it. She later proved it, much to the chagrin of those people who laughed at her at first. We will learn more. That's the beginning. My point, though, is that the immune system's primary job is to identify dangerously invasive organisms and to deal with them in a way that causes as little damage as possible. Now, immune systems misbehave. And when they do that, we get autoimmune disease. Most of us, or actually that's not really true, an unknown number of us are experiencing autoimmune disease partly because the signals our bodies are receiving from nature are all confused, right? You're breathing in chemistries from Dow Chemical and dryer sheets and insecticides and we've included antibiotics in the fundamental basis of the environment which has changed the genomes of trillions of microorganisms upon which our bodies depend since half the cells in our bodies aren't human. We get them from the environment. We get them from food. We get them from soil. We get them from our, our um, progenitors as children being touched and kissed and having our diapers changed. We get them from animal contact. Uh, we get them from contact with plants and fungi and living places. We inherit them. So the humans have been radically, ignorantly altering the fundamental bases of life on Earth for at least the past hundred years. Very short period of time, unimaginably. Not, that's not even... That's not a trillionth of a second in geological time. That's not an eye blink for Earth. But in that eye blink, we poisoned the oceans, obliterated the anciently conserved forests and most of their inhabitants who, by the way, would have taught us things about molecular biology we won't learn for the next 10,000 years um, because those organisms were so ancient. So if we were actually concerned about science or medicine, we would have known you absolutely have to preserve the oceans and the rainforests because those things are living pharmacopias with molecules so astonishingly advanced that we'll never be able to produce them on our own. And that doesn't mean you have to burn them down to get them. You can just study an organism and, and learn that it produces a certain kind of, you know, molecule or substance or has a biological process that we can use to cure disease. Or um, perhaps, although this is a much more dangerous goal in my view, extend life or um, reverse aging. I'm not a fan of the let's extend life and reverse aging <clears throat> agendas because our species is too ignorant to merit such benefits right now. Um, and that's a more complex argument that we can have another time. My point is our immune systems, the reason my friend Kevin called them the second brain is they determine the difference between, essentially, it's much more complex than this, but essentially they determine the difference between self and other, right? Between us and them. And in case it isn't obvious, our military and police are the biological analog of that. Now, as our own actual immune systems have become confused and attack our bodies, many of us suffer from at least minor autoimmune disease or we have immune deficiencies. So there's two kinds of problems with two basic domains of trouble with, with our immune system. One, it's not aggressive enough. It doesn't attack stuff. 
and it doesn't control infection. Yeah. Um, these are people who are immunocompromised, and that can happen in a variety of ways, but one of the ways it happens is simply by exposure to toxic uh, byproducts of human industry and activity in the environment. Yeah? Uh, and some people who've had cancer, which is um, a problem that derives from particular properties of cells reproducing. <clears throat> some of those people have had therapies that damage their immune systems to help them to survive. So they, they exchange the fact of the immune damage for survival, and then they live the rest of their lives immunocompromised. There are other people who are immunocompromised um, in general, people who suffered from diseases like HIV, uh, which by the way, in case you think this was invented, <laughs> in case you're one of those people who thinks, oh, the humans invented HIV. Well, it's not inconceivable they had some role in its propagation, but long before humans were capable of, oh, strange little thing, huh, okay. Long before humans were capable of doing anything with science, um, our, our species, our genome shows historically that we encountered HIV long, long ago, possibly before we were human. Um, that doesn't mean humans had nothing to do with its, with the origin and spread of modern HIV, although that is, that idea is generally considered to be a conspiracy theory. So I'm going to get back to this fact that our own immune systems have become wildly confused by the layered fictions of molecular and electrochemical noise produced by industry and um, the behavior of our collectives. We're surrounded constantly in electromagnetic fields and people say, well, electromagnetic fields come from the sun. Yeah, not mechanical ones, <laughs> not the ones that we are buried in. Um, constantly. And at the surface of a cell, the electromagnetic valences are crucially important to the extremely delicate production and processing and recognition of biomolecular relational signals and, and proteins and molecules and such. So <clears throat> there's, there's just all this noise, right? There's all this toxicity um, all around us in the environment. And some scientists will argue, well, you know, the, the skins of certain plants um, produce the uh, chemicals. Chemicals aren't a problem. They're right. Chemicals aren't a problem. Artificially produced chemicals that don't fit into the relationships in biology, those are a fucking problem. Believe me, right? Because they're toxic to organismal relationships. And over time, just like these layered fictions, that produce societies that are unsurvivably vicious and stupid, um, we get layers and layers of chemical and electromagnetic and biological noise, right? We've changed in our own bodies by taking antibiotics, which have some reasonably significant application, like a reasonably significant scope of a scope of reasonable application that's relatively narrow, by introducing those substances into our bodies, we've changed the genomes of our microbiota in ways that animals have never experienced before. And for purposes that make no sense, that have nothing to do with protecting us from invasive uh, bacteria that, that might cause catastrophic harm if they were allowed to sustain their reproduction. Um, that's a Puya Venus Venusta Chagulilo from Chile. Puya Venusta Chagulilo from Chile. The puyas produce astonishing flowers. My point is that um, 
When we discovered antibiotics, we came to believe that half the cells in our body were the enemy. And we started using products that wiped them out wholesale. This is like discovering that you have a wasp nest in a forest and burning the whole forest to the ground with like Agent Orange, right? Um, we grossly overreacted and we were ignorant about, I poked myself on that plant, we were ignorant about the actual nature of our own organismal complexity. So we developed these chemicals that wiped out and transformed, they caused mutation in the microbiota upon which our metabolisms intimately depend. And that's not undoable. You can't fix that. Probiotics don't fix that. There's no way to fix that. Um, once you're exposed, your microbiota are permanently transformed. And so our immune systems are confused because the contexts in which they normally functioned have been completely overwritten with layered, confusing fictions. And so our immune systems, they still work. You know, they work relatively well considering uh, the amount of astonishing confusion they have to function in. Um, for most of us, they do. But some of us suffer terrifying uh, immune dysfunction. And I have some. And I know people who suffer incredible, profound immune dysfunction that makes their lives miserable um, or barely survivable. I mean, some people's immune systems attack their own bones or attack their own blood or attack, you know, their tendons. Um, there's all kinds of immune, there's like a, a huge library of immune dysfunction that people are subject to that is really difficult. Allergies, you know, are one of those things. Allergies are generally your immune system responding to something that's relatively ordinary as if it were conceivably a biological invader. And so your immune system gets all sort of <laughs> um, has a little fit of, of temper and produces a bunch of armed, you know, uh, produces a little army, right? And goes after stuff that it actually, that has no relationship to being a disease. Stuff like pollen. This is the moon pool, my little sanctuary. So our own physical immune systems are unimaginably confused. And that means, well, they're often very confused. Let's put it that way. Um, I'm just going to show you this incredible reflection for a moment as we pause before I begin to talk about how our military and police, our governments and religions, are analogs of immune systems. Our society was founded on principles too antiquated to be repairable in our time. And instead of advancing and progressing and developing that society, we kept doubling down on these incredibly mispurposed, ineffectual ideas and methods from before colonial England, from Christianity, um, from religion. And by the way, governments, religions, military organizations, and police, all of these are analogous to immune systems in the sense that they are tasked with functions 
of keeping order, um, ensuring structures are reliable, and telling the difference between us and them. The religious declaration of kill the infidel uh, is a result of a situation where a layer of stories was used in hi historically to incite people to segregate themselves to see themselves as chosen and others as evil or damned or justifiably murderable. And our culture proceeded to adopt features from the religions, which may once have been the precursors to governments. In other words, they told us, they, they provided a structured system to distinguish between us and them. And we were the chosen people, and they were the bad guys. By the way, us and them isn't, sophist isn't sufficiently sophisticated to produce survivable social relations anywhere. <laughs> that kind of absolute disambiguation into a bipolar dichotomy gets us dead. Because unlike the layered fictions that our societies propose and elaborate upon and obey, life is a game of diverse relationships and making adjustments to ensure that diversity survives. Because we all depend on it. Because intrinsically we're made of it. When I see people, I am what I would call an ethnophile. So first of all, I'm unlike many intellectuals, I'm not a misanthropist. I don't hate humans. I adore nature, and what the human supercultures do in nature is cruelly tragic. But I'm not, I'm not a misanthrope. I'm anthrophilic, which means I love humans. But I'm not merely anthrophilic, I'm ethnophilic, which means I love diversity. I like to see people who are different from me and who uh, when I when I meet unique people from other cultures, I am thrilled and excited because I will I feel that I will discover new features of myself that had been lost to me um, over evolutionary time. So I will, I will retrieve new inner aspects of my own humanity that had been hidden from me in the diversity of others. And this is what makes me um, a diversophile and anthrophilic and ethnophilic. Right? Otherness doesn't terrify me. It, it, it makes me enthusiastic. It, it makes me feel excited. Um, one moment. So, for me, I could, it's not that I, I can... If, if, if I approach another human being that approaches me with fear or aggression or, uh, you know, something that, that looks predatory or feels, feels, you know, threatening, I can still respond with fear. That's, you know, within my, my purview. But generally speaking, I am friendly toward people who might seem superficially different from me. And for me, I don't want it any other way. I want, I'm hungry for diversity. One of the things I love is that living in San Francisco, as I walk down the street, I can hear languages from all around the world, and that means essentially from all throughout time. 
and place. Right? Now, I don't understand all those languages. In fact, the only language I technically understand is English. But I'm not a policeman. Though I can be triggered to be police-like under certain circumstances. So, for example, right now, I am required to raise this mask if I come within 30 feet of someone. And if they don't do that, there's the potential for me to feel a little bit like I should say, hey, 30 feet, you know? I don't really want to do that, although I understand the necessity of protecting each other during the pandemic. And the pandemic is no fiction. I know nurses and doctors in hospitals. I know virologists who've examined the organisms directly. I know microbiologists. It's not a fiction. Um, it may not be the only thing going on, right? There might be multiple... Uh, in science, there's a... There's a phenomenon called multiple determination, which is when you have a number of causal possibilities, each one of which is sufficient by itself to cause a phenomenon that you're, that you're looking at, right? that you're studying. So what's going on now on Earth is so complicated that there's likely to be some degree of multiple determination occurring. Uh, but that said, um, the novel coronavirus is an actual infective agent that in those who are vulnerable to it and possibly in those who don't at first appear vulnerable has really severe um, sequelae and the potential to be deadly. Um, this is a mystery we're still unpacking. It's going to take quite some time for us to unpack it. Our immune systems have never encountered anything like this that I am aware of. Uh, people will say like, well, the flu is a coronavirus. Yeah, it's not a coronavirus like the novel coronavirus. Even though that <laughs> there are some influenza strains that are coronaviruses, if I understand the research correctly. Now, my point about the police and our governments and the military and our system of courts is that they are supposed to act a bit like an immune system. And that means they're supposed to determine what things are dangerous and disorderly and address those things. Unfortunately, since the metaphor our culture resembles is sort of a combination of pirate armies and uh, prisons, right? It's a pirate army prison, <laughs> industrial complex. Um, our military forces and our police naturally inherit and express those qualities. And this is part of the problem that we're facing now. Our police, who should be the largely peaceful agents that protect and serve everyone who is in the United States. Notice I didn't just say citizens, right? Because when people visit our country, they also deserve humane, intelligent protection and, if necessary, defense. And not to be killed, um, not to be judged, not to be executed, because they match some middle ground symbolic derivation shorthand bullshit that has become endemic to the culture of police around the United States. And now that disease is spreading to other countries where it hasn't already spread. So <laughs> our, both our military, our military is totally disoriented because our government is idiotic, right? And by the way, that means we're, if, if you thought your government's capable of protecting you from a foreign threat, you're out of your fucking mind. Your government can't protect you from itself, right? It's like an immune system gone haywire. What we're experiencing in the United States, one moment, there's some of that noise I was talking about earlier, by the way, although I'm pretty sure my machine filters out a lot of it. Huh, it's a couple of planes flying way too close together. I think those are lotuses, but I'm not sure. 
Those are lily pads. Uh, our government is misfounded. It is not founded on principles that are humane or intelligent or noble. Those resemblances have become mere pretense. <clears throat> and so, similarly, the agents of the government, the court systems, the police, and the military can only be expressions of that noise and fiction masquerading as nobility and humanity and intelligence. The police are primarily there to protect the wealthy. And they are, they are manipulable. Um, the systems that we depend upon <laughs> to produce something analogous to what an intelligent immune system might do are obeying signals from what might as well be demons. And therefore, the intrinsic cultures, the cultures intrinsic to the layer of the fictional society we belong to that we call government, the layer that we call the court system, and the layer that we call the police, those things, they are not broken in the sense that they are doing precisely what they've always done. Um, they are executing the, the profiles and the templates. They are executing the the character of the dominant fictions and the dominant layers of fiction and the classes that inhabit those layers. They are naturally expressing the character of the fictions they are serving. And so until we establish layers of culture that are humane and intelligent, we're going to keep facing the same kinds of problems. But it helps us to understand this analogy between our immune systems being confused by all of the, the bizarre, um, intrus intrusive noise and toxicity of modern industrial and pharmacological culture and something not entirely dissimilar in our societies where the combined activity of our government, our military, and our police looks like autoimmune disorder. When it attacks, it attacks the wrong stuff for the wrong reasons. And we pay the price. We all pay the price. When, when tragedies occur, we are all complicit not necessarily because we would support those tragedies, though some of us are ignorant enough to do so, but because we thus far have failed to establish a society or culture intelligent or humane enough to protect us from that kind of deeply entrenched constant malfunction that many of us have experienced in one way or another, regardless of our, uh, though I will agree that, you know, the um, ratios are disproportionately, uh, <laughs> that certain people are disproportionately encumbered with the tragic results of this failure. And that's something that we all have to address together. But if we think we can address it just by yelling at the police, or even trying to change the police. I think that's an important cause, by the way, and I absolutely agree with it. Unfortunately, I suspect it's slightly insufficient. Um, the culture of the police is entrenched in the culture of our nation, the sort of circulating diseases of fictions that we 
that orient um, people with power and privilege and uh, prejudice. And weirdly, those things tend to go together. Power, privilege, and prejudice. So, today my goal was merely to outline some of these uh, important characteristics of the situation we're currently in. And the resemblance between an immune system gone haywire and our government, military, court system, police, and the fact that our nation is essentially a seedbed of prisoneering run by pirates. So it's hard to expect better behavior from something like that, right? Like if you look, if we actually tear the layers of fiction away, we're gonna see really, like we're gonna see things we didn't want to see, right? There's disgusting, omnicidally, brutal, cruel, vicious, avaricious atrocity, layer after layer after layer of this crap that our, that our society is founded on, and with a bunch of fictions like blankets over the top of it to keep that shit hidden so you don't freak out. Right? It's time to pull all that crap off. We need to take the bandage all the way off and look at the toxic mess underneath, reorient ourselves together, even in small, tightly, tightly knit groups. That's how it begins. You don't have to change the whole nation overnight. We have the capacity to form small, intelligent, highly efficient, tightly knit groups right now. We can do that anytime we have a conversation even, right? That's totally accessible to us. It's low hanging fruit in terms of, you know, how difficult is it for us to do this? If we can do that, if we can form uniquely intelligent, nobly in purposed mini societies, yeah, the way our species used to and is fundamentally inclined to succeed at because we are, we are this kind of animal like dolphins or gorillas or whales. We, fought, we form tightly knit social pods and those pods grant us astonishing, astonishingly rewarding features of role and character um, and opportunity and adventure that we innately need as human beings and that most of our jobs are the cruel replacements for. So there is hope, right? But it doesn't necessarily lie in full, in like trying to change things at the scale of the entire nation. Although it's absolutely crucial that we do everything we can together to ensure that some of the atrocities not all of the atrocities, but the particular forms of atrocity we are presently concerned with, that those come to an end. Now, absolutely. And, and that's an achievable goal. Um, but we're gonna, we're gonna have to learn how to drive our government, society and educational system rather than be driven by it. And that's a very complex transformation. Um, that's the large scale version of change, right? We are going to have to drive a system that was meant to oppress people to do something else. And if we understand that it started out as, a, as intending to oppress people, that's gonna help us, right? That's a piece of intelligence we need if we're going to have any chance of making meaningful change together. So the system is mispurposed at its roots, right? It wasn't here to protect you or serve you or do any of that crap. It was here to steal everything and wipe out the environment hide all that damage as long as possible, and then sort of get in, make the money, do the damage, hide it in the poor in the environment, and then get out and with, with big banks. Yeah, that's, that's the nature of the system we live in. It's a, it's, it's a system formed on <laughs> the principles <laughs> and ethos of piracy, right? essentially. And if we understand that, we're gonna have a better chance of modulating it. Um, now that's not the only way to see it, but it's one important perspective. And, and this is my goal, is just to present us with some perspectives that will be useful. I'm not trying to, to say this is how things are, or I know <laughs> how they are. I don't know how they are. They're far too complex for me to know. And yet, I have noticed things. And perhaps together, we have noticed something that we can attend in a way that will be mutually beneficial 
useful and perhaps give our ancestors our, and our progeny something that they won't, that won't be merely a tragedy, something that might be beautiful enough to celebrate together. I dream of a society more intelligent than our technologies and corporations are advanced. I dream of a society humane and noble and intelligent enough that we can truly be proud of it together. Thank you for spending time with me today. Bye-bye for now.